All right. We got Molly. Molly, you want to help me? Okay. Come on up, Molly. We got, uh, we'll have this to be ladies. This is ladies' uh, day today. Have ladies come and help me. Uh, let's see, who was here last night? Deb, you want to do it? Do you want to put you on the spot if you want to? Come on up. We'll help you. We'll do it. We'll, we're, uh, we're learning as we're going. Okay, you guys watch them. Make sure they got it. You guys ready? Uh, who's responsible to fulfill the Great Commission? I am. I am. I take personal responsibility. I am. What are we commanded to do? Make disciples. When do we do that? Very good. As we're going. And where do we do that? All nations. Very good. And how do we do that? As we're going, baptizing them, uh-huh, and teaching them. Uh, you got your arm around, you got the Bible here, and you're, you're walking together. Uh-huh, very good. And then um, why do we do this? It's a command, and also there's a special, special promise. What's that special promise? He said he'd be with us as we're making disciples. Very good. Great job. Excellent job. One clap. One clap. One clap. One clap. Okay, very good. Hey, these, this fruit is awesome. These are the best green grapes I've had this year. Oh, man. And I have to wait. I have to wait to do this. And we're going to look at um, vision and strategy. Come on in. Let's get a seat. Ernest, great to have you. We had a great time last night hearing about how these guys, how Jesus changed their life. Ernest, is this your son right here? Just a friend, okay. All right, well, hey, let's get started. Let me pray for us. Our Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters here on the island, and I pray that you'd use this time in our lives, that you give us encouragement and also uh, clarity on uh, what you've commanded us to do. So, Lord, we look to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. The year was 1956. 1956, it was July 18th. A guy named Dawson Trotman, he was, he was sitting on the lakeside of Scroon Lake, New York. I've been there. I water skied on that lake. It's Word of Life Bible. It's the Word of Life Bible Institute, Word of Life Island there. One of the, man, it's just a beautiful place. So this is back in 1956, and Dawson Trotman was sitting along the, the lakeside, and he was reading a book called Power Through Prayer by E.M. Bounds, one of my favorite books. And he had this really pensive look on his face, and his friend walked up to him. He called him Dawes, short for Dawson. Dawes, what's on your heart? Dawson Trotman, he said, the world is on my heart. And we say that's what vision is, is, is getting on your heart what God has on his heart, and he has on his heart the whole world. And we're going to look at vision and strategy this morning. And I want you to say this with me. We're going to say two phrases or two, two quick sentences. See the masses through the man. Build the man to reach the masses. So say that with me. See the masses through the man. Build the man to reach the masses. For the ladies, you would just change it in your mind. See the masses through the woman. Build the woman to reach the masses. So we, we say men disciple men, women disciple men, women. And if you have, uh, if you're a husband, absolutely, you're discipling your kids. Uh, you're washing your wife in the word. Sometimes we're going along and, on the way to church and we'll be talking about the scripture and I'll reach over, I'll touch my wife's leg, and I'll kind of go like this and say, I'm washing you in the Word. And uh, so that's the idea about washing your wife in the Word. But it's men discipling men, women discipling women. So see the masses through the man. Uh, look, there, there's, wherever I go in the world, there's, there's two really big needs wherever I go in the world. Um, different countries, different places, and it's, uh, it's illustrated by these two different thoughts. We'll start out with the first thought. i got a question for you. If every prayer you'd ever prayed over the last six months were answered exactly the way you prayed them, would the world be a different place? If every prayer you prayed over the last six months were, were answered exactly the way you prayed it, would the world be a different place? Because the world, if what we pray about is really what's on our heart. Usually what we pray about is my health, my family's finances, 
uh, kind of our little circle. Normally, people are not praying for other parts of the world. And as we're making disciples, that's one of the things I like to do with guys is to expose them through video, through uh, taking them on trips, to expose them to other parts of the world. So it's to see the masses through the man. I want them to get on, on their heart what God has on his heart, and that's the whole world. So let's look at the, the first slide, if, uh, if we could. So we've got the two questions about what you pray. If every prayer you prayed, it reveals what's on our heart. Let's go to the next one. So spiritual vision is vital. And, and here's another question. Here's our second question. That, the first one was talking about vision, getting on your heart what God has on his heart. If every, prayer you pr- if every prayer you prayed were answered exactly the way you prayed it, would the world be a different place? Let's go and talk about strategy now. And here's the question I like to ask about strategy. Do you know of a church, present day, a church that you're a part of, a church that you know, if that church were picked up and placed in Jerusalem in the first century, could that church rewrite the book of Acts? With a church that you know, if it were picked up here and placed in Jerusalem, the first century, would they be able to write the book of Acts? If not, why not? Do they have uh, a a different Jesus? It's the same Jesus. Different Holy Spirit? Same Holy Spirit. Do they have a different Bible? Do we have a different Bible than they? Trick question. We do. We have a completed version of the Scripture. They, they were writing the scripture. As Luke was traveling with Paul, he's writing the book of Acts and all the different gospels. So we have the advantage. We have air travel, we have email, we have Skype, we have all of these benefits. But to see what's really taking place in the world, we're, we're limited really by really one word. Our big need is that one word and it's strategy. Strategy. To do ministry the way, the way Jesus did ministry. He was building into these men, these 11 men, And they went on. Paul came later. Barnabas came later. These people came later, and they were able to impact the world, the known world at that time. So let's go to, um, that's the key word is strategy. Let's go to the next one. So vision is seeing from God's point of view, getting our heart what God has on his heart, the thought by Dawson Trotman. Keep on going. I love this quote by Henrietta Muir. She's the one who, had, who influenced Bill Bright and Vonette Bright with, with uh, Crusade, Campus Crusade. Now it's called Crew. But this is what she says. She says, when I consider my ministry, I think of the whole world. I love this. When I think of my ministry, I think of the whole world. Anything less than that would not be worthy of Christ, nor his will for my life. So, man, I, I want us, as we're thinking through these next, you know, this next day, the rest of today and, and tomorrow, to be thinking about the world, how you personally will be able to impact the world as you invest in faithful men, women, investing in faithful women. So that was Henrietta Mears. What does God have on his heart? It's the world. Let's go to the next one. Let's look at this right here. So see the masses. This is really an easy one. Look at uh, in, your, in your worksheet. Let's see if we have one of these. Let's see what page that's on. Page, is that page four? I don't have my glasses on. So page four is one that looks just like this. So this is really an easy one to reproduce. So I want you to take notes and just kind of do what I'm doing. And what I talked to the people last night is, uh, for those of us who are are new with us here today, I like to ask the question, will this stop with you or will this spread through you to other people? Whatever you're receiving, we need to be a conduit to other people. So we need to take notes, and this is, a, this is a great one, excuse me, to be able to reteach to somebody else. It's very, very uh, user-friendly. Just to be able to write down these things, it's very easy to reteach these things. So first of all, Matthew 28 is to see the masses. Matthew 28, 19, it says what? Someone want to read that for us? Matthew 28, 19. Very good. That's the idea of all nations. This is what God has on his heart, all nations. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 1 Timothy 1.15. Let's look at that. 1 Timothy 1.15. Who's got that? It 
Anybody got that? First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.15, I'll get it. It says, this is the faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. I've heard somebody say, if, if Paul was the chief, I was one of the braves. So uh, all of us are sinners in need of, desperate need of a Savior. So it's the world. He, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Matthew 13, 38 says, talking about the seed and the sower, it says the field is the world. Aren't you glad he said that? He didn't just say it's Jerusalem. It's the whole world for Gentiles, for every one of us. Also, 1 John 2, 2 says that Jesus is the propitiation. It's the satisfaction that, that God needs because of our sin. He's the, the, uh, the perfect sacrifice for us. He's a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So to see the masses and also the whole world. Let's go to the next slide. Vision. I really like this. Check this out. Go to the next one. Check the, well, let's go step by step through this. If, if someone has no vision, this is the way I was, guys, about 13 years ago. I'd wake up in the morning and I'd say, okay, well, what am I going to do? I uh, need to read the Bible. I need to pray, talk to God, you know, obey him. I had that idea. But I didn't really have a vision. Or uh, neither did I have a strategy to impact the whole world. I didn't have it. So when you have no vision, there, there's kind of confusion. I get up and I kind of go and I just do the next thing. So no vision. Let's look at the next one. No vision. If you have a limited vision, there's limited success. If my, if my vision is, hey, we want to start a church in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, that, that's a limited vision. But if we're saying, hey, we want to start a church in Memphis, Tennessee, that will have repercussions all around the world. Our vision is for the whole world. So limited, su- limited vision is limited success. If you have a God-sized vision, there's, there's potential for God-sized success. I heard about a, there was a, a church leader that was in his study, he was, he was praying, and he was getting ready to teach a lesson. Uh, maybe he was an elder in a church or one of the leaders, and he's praying, oh, God, I need your power. Oh, God, I need your power. Praying and, and, and fasting, Lord, I need your help. And then one day he said, as, it's as if God took the roof off of his study. And it, as if God said to him, my son, with plans no bigger than yours, you don't need my power. Maybe you're saying that your, your, your plans are so small, you don't need my power. If we have a God-sized vision, we need God to do his work. So we're talking about God-sized vision. Limited vision, limited success. Let's go to the next one. If we have a vision to impact the world, minus a plan, we don't have a plan really how to do that. We just have a vision, minus a plan, minus action. It's just a dream. Yeah, we got a dream, man. We'd like to do that. We don't know how to do that, but this is our vision. We're after, we're after the whole world. But I don't really have a vision how to do that, and I don't really have action. Let's go to the next one. So if you have vision and a plan, a strategy that Jesus used through multiplication to impact the world, a vision plus a plan minus action, if I'm not busy doing that, it's just guilt. Because I know what I need to do, but I'm not doing it. So I was talking to a guy during the break, and he said, you know, I I need to be doing this. I I know I need to do this. And... uh, so there's action that's involved. If, if we know these things, if we're not doing it, there's just kind of guilt. Vision plus a plan minus action is just guilt. But here it is. Here's what we're after right here. Vision plus a plan plus action, it equals spiritually productive ministry. So we have a vision to go after the whole world with a plan to do that through multiplication, investing in faithful men who will then invest in others. And action, we, we get engaged in the process. We're praying. And I, I like to challenge people to do this. Take this next month. If you don't have anybody that you're discipling right now, would you say, Lord, show me somebody to disciple during this, this every day. You pray that every day. In the morning when you get up, whenever you're, you're spending time with God, God, would you show me, show me one person, at least one. You can't have five until you have one. Give me one person, Lord, that I can invest in. And after a period of time, I believe God will show you. It's just having eyes to see those people. And usually there's a connection, there's a friendship. Now, you guys know that some people, it's like oil and water when you have a friendship. And some people, it's just so easy to have a friendship. Uh, my friend Steve, the guy who discipled me, we uh, were recently on this retreat uh, for the guys, uh, some of the leaders in our church. And we had a guy come in, and he talked to us about different personality types and all that. And, and I, I shouldn't have been surprised, but we have exactly kind of the same kind of personality. 
It's the Myers-Briggs deal, ES, you know, whatever, all that stuff. So we, we lined up exactly because we have really a connection. Steve, we just get along very well. And you're not going to identify with everybody, but there are people that you're really going to identify with. And some of the ways to look for these people, say if you're teaching a, a Bible class or something after class, maybe it'll be a, a, a young guy that comes up and talks to you or a young woman for the ladies comes up and talks to you. They just want to be around you. They're, they they, they want to hang out. And you start thinking, hey, this could be a possible person. So you're, just, you, you're praying, Lord, show me somebody that you, you want me to invest in. Make it clear to me. So... Vision plus a plan plus action, that's spiritually productive ministry. That's what we're after. So that's the first part. See the masses. See the masses. Now let's go to the next one. Through the man. Through the man. The key word in, in the New Testament really is disciple. You see disciple, it says, last night we talked about that, 269 times the word disciple is used. 269 times. The word Christian is used three times. But we use the word Christian a lot. But I believe Jesus was out after to make disciples. That's what he was about, making disciples. And Matt just did a great job. He was teaching through Luke chapter 5, 1 through 11 in the men's tent over here. And uh, it's as if in that moment, you guys are familiar for the ladies to bring them up to speed. They didn't hear the, the, the lesson. Jesus was walking along the, the, the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. People were pressing on him to hear the word of God. And, he, man, he just has to get away. And he, he sees two boats there. One of them is Peter's. Not a surprise. I, I believe he's after Peter. He's going to Peter's boat. So he goes down, and uh, he asks Peter, can I get in your boat? So he gets in the boat, and they push out a little bit from the land, and he begins to teach the people. He sits down to teach. And, in fact, he's teaching Matthew chapter 13 about the seed and the sower. We see that through parallel passages. He's teaching Matthew 13. So he's teaching... After that, he turns to Peter. He said, hey, let's go fishing. He said, hey, Lord, hey, we've been fishing all night. We didn't catch anything. Whoa, what was that? Whoa. <laughs> oh, he got shot. You know? <laughs> so he said, uh, but he says, nevertheless, it's your, it's your word, I will. So they go out and they throw out the nets and they catch more fish. Their nets begin to break. They call for their buddies, James, John, they need help. They bring all this fish in and then Peter falls down to Jesus' knees. He says, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Jesus says this. He says, Peter, do not fear from now on, you're going to be catching men. So that's, that's the idea. And it's, in, it's as if at that moment, now Jesus didn't wear glasses. Glasses came much later. But it's as if Jesus was wearing bifocals. He could see Peter up close where he was at that moment, but he also saw what he would become later on. He saw Peter at that moment. Hey, Peter, do not fear. From now on, you're going to catch men. Later on, Acts chapter 2, he preaches 3,000 men or 3,000 people, they trust Christ and they're baptized. Acts 4 says about 5,000 men trusted the Lord. Acts chapter 10, the Gentiles, the, the people, the Gentiles, Cornelius' household comes to faith in Christ. So I like to use this. Here's a figure. This, this figure right here represents Jesus, and this represents Peter. It's as if he could see Peter right there. I know who you are, Peter, and I know what you're going to do. And for that matter, he sees you where you are. He sees the young, young people, Molly, all you guys in, in this room, in this place. He sees where you are right now. He sees where you are spiritually. He knows what you've been through. He knows your history. But he also knows what you can do. He knows your potential. He knows what's coming in the future. So it's, here it is, it's see the masses, here where this would represent the masses, everybody that Paul or that Peter would impact. And not only that, this is where it gets good. It's not just Peter, but it's the lives of these other people. Peter say he impacts these three, and then these guys go out and touch other people's lives. It's not just everyone that Peter's touching, it's the ones, as he's investing in these people, they're touching others and others and others. So we think of, of Randall. God changes his heart. Randall's going to touch lives. He's touching lives right now. And John, we, we heard his story last night, how God's working through John. Each, you can put each one of your names in there in that slot. Ernest. These people, are, you guys are going to touch people's lives, the ladies. You guys are going to touch people's lives. And look, they're going to touch other people. So it's seeing the masses through the man, through eyes of faith, what God is going to do with each of you in your ministry. That's where it gets exciting. When uh, this guy, David, he would come over to our house and, and uh, we would get the map out. 
a world map, kind of an, an atlas, a big thing, National Geographic. And we would get there on our knees. It was um, David and four other guys. We'd get there around, the, around our knees, on our knees around the map, and we'd begin praying for other parts of the world. And we'd pray for, uh, we prayed for India during that time. David, now he's a missionary in India. So when I see David, I don't just see India. I, see, I don't see, just see David. I see everybody that David will impact, who he's impacting now, and the potential that will happen. Heard this story? Heard the story, heard the story uh, last night about Becky's mom. That at her funeral, people were coming up, adults were coming back and saying, your mother had an impact in my life. She led me to faith in Christ. That's, that's, that, I think, is the dream that all of us, we want. At the end of our life, to have people that we've impacted and that they've impacted others and others. So let's see the masses through the man or see the masses through the woman. Look at this. Build the man or build the woman to reach the masses. So build the man. There are some things that we want to teach. Whenever we spend time with people, there are certain principles, certain... We, we want them to have a, a full tool belt. We want them to be able to evangelize. I want them to be able to teach. I want them to be able to preach. I want them to be able to, to minister to people, to counsel, to, uh, to serve, and however God has designed them. And this is the beauty. When I get to know somebody, I want to just ask them questions, really get to know them, because it's not like a cookie-cutter kind of thing where we got a little uh, an assembly line, we're going to make these disciples. Every, God, has, God has designed Hans a certain way. He's designed uh, John a certain way. All of us have our, our way that God has wired us. So if I think, you know, hey, John wants to be, he has that evangelistic, he, he, that fire. He wants to, to see people come to faith in Christ. I want to get him with the best evangelist I know so that way he's training John to give John, John gets to stand on his shoulders and to equip John to do the work. So I want people to, to know how to share the Lord. For example, Matthew 4.19, it says what? Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. So our job is to follow. It's his job to make me a fisher of men. Sometimes if we're not fishing, I would say perhaps we're not following as closely as we should. If we're following him, it's just a natural tendency. We're going to, to try to reach out to other people. So part of it is just getting equipped, have somebody to teach us, to train us. And one of the best ways to teach and train you, I, I couldn't really teach evangelism in a class like this. It's, it's not going to be that effective. We can teach principles. The way we really learn is when we go out and mix it up on the street. I'm excited to hear about your farm festival, the coconut festival. Great opportunities to be equipped, trained to get the gospel out. So you can be practicing to get trained to go out there and do that ministry. And then for the rest of the year, you know, you pull out that half a sheet of paper that shows the bridge diagram with the cross. Man, you can, you're ready to go. Knock it out. So that would be, if you guys haven't been, been, uh, been trained, I would say jump on that as fast as you can. Next one is Mark 3.14. Jesus selected the 12 to be with him, and then he sent them out to preach. So we call this the with me principle. We have to have time together with the people. Uh, a friend of mine calls this the flow time. You're just flowing together as you go through life. So Mark, four, uh, Mark 3, 14, selected the 12 to be with him, then he sent them out to preach. Two parts, to be with him, and then he sent them out. So he's training, he's equipping to then send them out, to call them apostles. Let's go to the next one, uh, Matthew 14, 20. If you look at uh, Matthew chapters 14 through chapter 20, you see how Jesus is training his men. Just he would, he would teach and train, and then he would give them a test. Teach and train, he'd give them a test. This is the way that, that he developed his men. Now check this out. Look at John 17, 4. I remember when I saw this for the first time, somebody showed me this, and it really impacted me. So hopefully this will, will be impactful in your life too. Uh, John 17, 4. Let's look at that. John 17, 4. How's everybody doing? You guys with me? Okay. John 17, 4. Got somebody with a good, strong voice wants to read that? John 17, 4. Okay, wow. Okay, hold on right there. I finished the work you've given me to do. What was the work of Jesus? What do you think the work of Jesus was? Okay, seeking to save the lost, very good, excellent. Other, what else do you think? To save us from our sins. 
Now, now check this out. There's two places where Jesus says, I finished the work or it is finished. One is John 19.30. That's when he's on the cross. He says, it is finished. That means that he's saying the debt is paid. He's paid for our sin with his blood. So it is finished. And here he says in John 17.4, this is two chapters prior to the cross. He's saying, I've finished the work you've given me to do. When I saw this, I, I thought, you know, what, what is this work he's talking about? In this chapter of John 17, there are 26 verses. 26 verses in John 17. 46 times he mentions the men that you've given me. He talks about them, uh, the men you've given me. So time, and he's praying for his men. And it's really a model about how we should pray for the guys that God brings into our life prayed for them time and time and time again. And just in those 26 verses, 46 times he mentions those men. I finished the work. He was talking about, if you want to take in your, your pencil or your pen and write, this is talking about reproduction. Okay, and fit it in there. Reproduction. This is talking about redemption in John 19.30 is redemption. So John 17, 4 is talking about reproduction, how Jesus was investing his life in those men. John 19, 30, it says, it is finished. Now let's look at, let's look at Matthew 28, 21. Who's got that? Matthew 28, 21. Matthew 28, 21. What? What did you say, Kent? What kind of Bible do you have there? Matthew 28, 20. It stops at 20. <laughs> it's a, this is a joke. Oh, a Trick question. Trick question. Normally when Jesus would teach, the disciples would say, Lord, what do you mean by that, about forgiving people? What? They always had questions, didn't they? And in John chapter, when I go through the Great Commission, there are no questions. You don't hear people saying, uh, no, what do you mean by discipling? Why was it so? It was clear because they had walked with him for those three years. They had seen him disciple them. So then they, uh, it, it, the, it dawns on them, hey, what you're saying is then what you've done with us about making disciples, now it's our job to make disciples of other people. That's, our, that's what we're commanded to do. So there was there, no need for a Q&A. They knew exactly what he was, t- when he was talking about, about making disciples because they had just experienced it. Now, I, I talk about teaching. We need to teach the guys or for the ladies, the women that God gives you. You're teaching them. You're training them. And also there's that relational aspect of, of ministry. You're spending time together. So teaching, training, and the relational part. And, guy, here's, here's what's cool. What we're talking about, these principles, this isn't, like I said earlier, it's not a fad. It's not, um, not a gimmick. But these these principles have the potential. I'm not, this is not an exaggeration. This has the potential to change your life and ministry. And the lives of a lot of, I almost said it in Spanish, mucha gente, a lot of of people can be changed as a result of this. So it's not a gimmick, not a fad, but these things have an idea. These principles have have a, a potential of changing your life, your ministry, the way you do life. So let's go to the next one. So see the masses through the, man, it's getting kind of warm in here, right? Stand up, stand up. It's getting kind of warm. Wow. I can see you guys just glazed over on me. It's late. We've been sitting for a while. You know, I've been to these seminars where these guys get up there. It's like, you know, six or seven hours. You're saying, this guy, just just shut him up. I can't take anymore. So, (laughs) Bob, can we do (laughs) For the guys. All right. We'll go ahead and and stretch a little bit. Stretch. Go like this. Uh Uh-huh. Very good. Stretch. Raise your hands up. Good. Ooh, doesn't that breeze feel good? I went to one of those restaurants. Have you seen those big, like these huge fans? You've seen those things, like a big Texas, kind of like Texas fans or something. Or it's called another name, but it's just a fan. This fan is probably like 20 feet wide. It's just, it'd be awesome. Okay, go ahead. Have a seat. <clears throat> we got w- one more to go. See the masses through the man. Build the man to reach the masses. We're going to look at this a little bit more in detail, 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to look at this tonight. So this is a little preview. This is a little appetizer to get you guys ready. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul is investing in Timothy, singular, one person, but he says invest in faithful men, make a deposit 
in faithful men. It goes to plural, singular to plural, and then to others. So you see what can happen, the potential of that growing, so to reach the masses. We talked about this a little bit last night, 7.1 billion in the world population. This is for our people who are visiting with us or uh, just arrived today. And for its, its review, for those of you who were here last night, repetition, well, I'll say things time and time again. Why? Because I think you guys are slow. Absolutely not. You guys are smart. But it's the best way to learn is repetition. Repetition. In Albania, there was a saying, I lived in Albania for two years, they had a saying, they said, uh, repetition is the mother of learning. But they went on to say it's the father of boredom also. So I don't want to bore you, but it really is the mother of learning. That's the way we learn is through repetition, repetition. So with seven, we're going to say we're going to freeze the world population at 7.1 billion people. And if we had, uh, Randall's going to preach every night, 3,000 people, we say 3,000 people getting saved every night. In order to reach the 7.1 billion, it takes 6,480 years. 6,480 years for him to reach those people. Now, he looks young, but I don't think he's, he's going to live that long, 6,480 years. Now, check this out. If we just spend time, I used this last night. Say this wrist represents my, uh, my life, and I had to spend time with five guys. It starts out with just six of us. And after that, say we spend time a year investing in these guys, and after that, they get five. And after that, these guys get five. So it starts out slowly, and then it just branches out like that rapidly. It would take, if nobody drops the ball, and we know we're battling against the, the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's not like a, an automatic chain. It's always going to work out. No, we're in a battle. But if in an ideal world, if everything worked just right, if I took one person or these five people every year, it would take between 12 and 13 years for the whole world to not only come to faith in Christ, but to be discipled. If I take just one person, this is the reason. Here, this is, this is really cool. This is the reason I like to do this in small group settings. One-on-one, -on -one, I, I like this one guy, um, Howard Hendricks. He's kind of like the godfather of, of making disciples. Howard Hendricks, he says, you know, I have one problem with saying I do one-on-one -on -one discipling. He says, Jesus didn't do it like that. Jesus did it in a small group. But there were those times when he'd take uh, Peter off to the side, he would talk to them. Now, if you don't have five, if you don't have 12, you start with one. You start, that's a cool, that's, you start with one. But there's something about when I, when I have a small group, I love that because we're learning from each other. We're learning that way. And if, say, one guy's not there, then we still have, you know, four guys we're working with. And also, not every, I know that not every one of these guys are going to multiply. My desire is I'd love to have all five of these guys multiply. But I think as I work with five, at least one of those guys, I want them to be able to multiply into the lives of somebody else. So it's automatic. If I just have one person, it's just like addition. But if I have five, I have the most more, more potential for multiplication. Can I yes, sir. Uh huh. No, you're good. Good. Great question. The question was, how do you determine who the faithful people are? And a, a short answer, we're going to go into more detail on that um, later on today. But just a quick answer would be, you have to test them to see if they're faithful. We have a saying, don't spend your life carving rotten wood. A lot of people, they try to go and disciple somebody, and they're not ready. There's no hunger, there's no spiritual desire, and there are certain qualities I look for. Do they have a, a hunger for God's word? Uh, do, they, do, they, uh, do they love to follow Christ? Is there, do they have a heart for God? Are they, uh, are, they, are they faithful, available? Are they teachable? Is there a heart for God? Maybe they're already involved in ministry. They're already involved. They're already faithful. They're, they're showing themselves to be faithful right now. So those are kind of guys, those are kind of these, these clues, these, these, um, these uh, what, ca uh, characteristics I'm looking for. But I've, I've been doing this now for about 12 or 13 years. Every once in a while I'm wrong, but now I can get to where I can almost smell the person. I said, man, I think that guy is going to be a great guy. I think he, he has that heart for God. And you know what, guys? I can't put that in there. I can't put that, uh, that desire uh, for the Word of God. God puts that in there. God, I can't put that. I can fan the flame. I can encourage them. But God's the one who puts that heart for God in there. I can just kind of look for that and see who the guys are, who are the, for the ladies, who are the young women. They're ready. They want to grow. And it doesn't mean that 
that maybe some people are not ready right then, but now we want to work with the people who are ready. They asked this guy, Leroy uh, Iams, they said, um, who are the guys you go, you go after? He said, great, question, great answer. He said, I'm going to go after the ones who are the closest to be able to help me to reach the others. So the ones who are already there on the verge, the ones who are the most faithful, I guess, hungry, I'm going to work with them and train them so that way they can help me with the others. So work with the people who are hungry, faithful, available, teachable. God's the one who puts those in there. That's a great question. So we're, we'll, we'll, we'll hit that some more later on. Thank you. So to see the masses through the man, build the man to reach the masses. All of us, guys, we'll close with this. Is it about lunchtime right now, Bob? Okay, lunchtime, we'll do what time? Yeah, we may just, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll jockey it a little bit. Uh, I think we can. Do, is lunch, is it a hard, hard fast, 11.45? Or is, is the food coming in, or are they making it? Or? Okay, cool. Well, we'll just, we'll make sure that we're ready to go at 11.45. Um, so right now, so that'd give us about 30 minutes. Let me say this right here. The, uh, dogs, dogs live for really about three things. It's true. Dogs live for about three things. They live to eat, sleep, take care of their own needs. So if, if you have a group of dogs, if another dog wants to come in, he's, I'm not going to share my food with this guy. You've seen their, their little lips come up and you show the canine. But then something happens. These dogs, you ever see a fox go by? They see a dog, see that fox, they say, what the heck was that? Was that like a, like a souped up cat? What is that thing? So they take off after that. Is there something inside me? I got to chase that fox. So they're chasing that fox. And they start chasing that fox. And then as they go through the neighborhood, these other dogs will say, hey, hey, what? if dogs can talk, I don't know if they can talk. They say, hey, what are you guys doing? Hey, man, we're chasing a fox. And he said, what's a fox? He said, I don't know, but it's up there. So they're chasing this fox. They're bumping into each other. It's no big deal. Why? Because they're after the fox. The ones who didn't see the fox, they kind of fall off to the side. But the ones who saw the fox, they're going to chase that fox till they catch it. We as Christians were like dogs. We live to take care of our own needs. We want to eat, you know, take care of just eat, feed ourselves, take care of my own needs, eat. A lot of sometimes people in the church are sleeping. Eat, sleep, take care of my own needs. If someone comes in the church that kind of threatens me, uh, I feel threatened by them. <laughs> but then something happens. They see a fox. And they chase after that fox. No big deal. They're bumping in each other. Hey, no big deal. They're chasing after that fox. And then they catch the fox. The ones who, maybe the ones who didn't see the fox, they kind of drop off. But the ones who saw the fox, they're going to be after that fox for the rest of their life. Now, the fox for the Christian is the world. Once you see what God has given us, a vision to impact the whole world, a strategy to get there, if we get in the game, start investing in people, giving them a vision to impact the world, it's, it's possible in a relatively short amount of time to impact a whole lot of people. Now, guys, I don't know exactly how it's going to work, but I want, uh, I want my life to be like this. Stand before the Lord, and, and I want him to say more than anything, well done, good and faithful servant. I want him to say that. Well done, good and faithful servant. And then maybe behind me, I'll see, I'll see a, this group of people, kind of like that picture last night going out. And I see these guys that I know. I know Billy. I know Greg. I know Will. I know Sergio, David. I know these guys. But, Lord, I see people there from, they're dressed like they're from Pakistan. People are dressed like they're from, from Australia, North America. A whole lot of people from Hawaii, uh, people from Nepal, India. Wow. Lord, who are all those people? See, I'm glad you asked. Because you were faithful to invest in these men right here, and you taught them to do the same. They invested in these, and they invested in these, and that's why they're here, through God's grace. Investing in faithful men and faithful women. It says the Bible, or it says right here, <laughs> a strategy that Jesus used, to see the masses through the man. Remember, Jesus saw through Peter. 
the masses. See the masses through the man, build the man to reach the masses. Let's go ahead and we'll close out. I think we'll uh, maybe take a, an extended break, um, hang out and talk, and we'll have lunch at 11.45. We'll, do, we'll adjust the schedule. We'll make it happen. So um, thanks, you guys, for listening. And uh, let's pray together as we close out. Uh, Lord, we're grateful, first of all, for salvation, that we weren't seeking you. You were the one who, who sought us out. You rescued us, and you saved us. And Lord, thank you that we don't have to come up with our own strategy about how to impact the world. You've already given it to us. Um, I'm not smart enough to come up with my own idea. Lord, I, I want to just do what you've showed us to, how to do, how to make disciples. You've, you've shown us how to do that. And Lord, we want to be uh, faithful to do that. So Lord, I pray for, again for my brothers and sisters here, that, and for myself too, Lord, that you would give me faithful men to invest in, for them faithful men and women, and that you would use them again to impact this island. That, uh, like it said in the New Testament, you filled Jerusalem with this doctrine, that, that it could be said of these people here, that you filled the island of Kauai with this doctrine. Uh, that those who have turned the world upside down have come here also, that that would be said of these people. Lord, use them to, in their, in their witness just to be gracious, to be compassionate, loving, and put that fire of evangelism in their hearts that they want to look to share with other people. Lord, I pray that you give them faithful men and women to invest in, and they would truly impact the ends of the earth for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a break. Is it warm in here? Are you guys, is this warmer than normal? Is it normally a little bit like 10 degrees cooler or more wind? We need wind. You get, there it is right there. Get a little wind. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Does everybody say? What do you say? What do you think? Are you doing Spanish? Are you teaching Spanish?